Good afternoon, it's a lovely sunny day Thank here in much. North Africa. Uh, we are Ethan Ruben History Boys, I'm Ethan. I am Ruben, and today we're going to be talking to you a little bit about khaki drill, uh, the origins of khaki drill, and a bit about the webbing and the types of warfare in North Africa in particular. And then after that we'll be talking to a bit about India and Burma and the type of things that were going on in there. Yep, so we'll jump right in with the uniform. So we are in perhaps Tobruk, somewhere in the North African campaign. Uh, the war in Europe, it might be about 1941, the war in Europe is grinding somewhat to a halt in the west for Britain. Um, we are, there's no major battles going on. Uh, the Germans occupy most of Europe at the moment. So the much of the British army are engaged in North Africa at the moment to try and hold that segment yes. of land fighting the Germans and the Italians. So what we are portraying today is the York and Lancaster Regiment. Uh, that is the 14th Infantry Brigade, 2nd Battalion, and this battalion were involved in the Battle of Crete in 1941 and later joined the 70th Infantry Division and fought in Tobruk in 1942, which is what we are doing today and after 1942 they went over to India and Burma and they joined in with the second Chindit campaign but that is what we're betraying yep. today. It's a really warm day here today in East Anglia so we're yes. enjoying the sun and we'll have a bit of a conversation with you. So the uniform that the chaps in North Africa were wearing. These are called khaki drill uniforms. Uh, khaki being an Urdu word for dust. And this type of uniform, made from the thinner, perhaps air text material, yeah. was sort of first seen in the British Army uh, towards the end of the 19th century. So in the Sudanese campaigns and the Boer War campaigns, where red was tending to go out of fashion you could be seen something awful especially by enemy snipers so the chaps were taking the sand and the dust of the ground and rubbing it on their red uniforms to try and hide it as I said khaki is just Urdu for dust so dusty so the uniform colour gets its name from that yes so um, as you can see we're wearing a uh, different variety of uh, clothing items so Ethan here is wearing the Airtex shirt. This is a long sleeve Airtex shirt, but due to the hot weather, he's decided to roll it up um, to make it a short sleeve. And you can see this, the Airtex is nice and thin. There's lots of pinholes in it. I don't think you can get close to the camera, but there, all these pinholes mean that the air can flow through. If you don't mind putting your arm up, if you want, you can even see this air pocket under, poor that stinks Ethan. We can even see this air pocket again, uh, Laos, allows the air to flow through. Um, on Ethan's bottoms, he is wearing um, some trousers. Can you lift your leg, Ethan? Yep. Possible. There we can see the lovely trousers there. Um, again, Airtex material. To keep the trousers nice and tight to the boot, you right there? Yep. Um, he is wearing the putties. Uh, very, very common again in the Second World War. Um, I think they originated in the First World War from the long putties, but these are now shorter putties, which allows more mobility. Uh, myself, I'm also wearing the Airtex shirt, but I might feel a bit chilly at night, so I would wear this lovely woolen jumper, again khaki colour, uh, for camouflage if I decide to wear it in the day. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck! And then <laughs> I have got my lovely shorts there. They are also the Airtex material, very similar to the trousers there. Uh, again, allowing the air flow through and mobility. I've got my long socks there to support the lower leg and I suppose can be warm? Yes, yeah. yes. And the anklets or the gaiters on my ankles also protecting the boots. <laughs> <laughs> they wear the standard ammo boots of the rest of the army. Well, they might be able to purchase some desert boots which are made out of, sort of a more suede material. Now the khaki drill uniform was introduced uh, in sort of 1940 or this particular styles of it at the start of earlier bits of the war and the trousers and the shorts they follow similar patterns to the battle dress apart from they do not have leg pockets they still have the shell dressing pockets for a shell dressing a yeah, uh, bandage if you're wounded you'd be able to apply that to yourself or a friend and the shirts are collared 
so it can be worn just like this without the need for a khaki jacket but we'll show you a khaki a khaki drill jacket uh, later on we'll also talk a bit about headwear in a minute as well yeah. um, that's everything for yep. those so I talk about headwear now? yeah <laughs> yes so headwear we can see the two common types of headwear being worn out in um, Africa Ethan here has got the FS cap also commonly used by lots of infantry um, in the earlier parts of the war before the GS cap came out uh, also used by the Home Guard um, back in Britain you can see on his head I'm actually going to that yeah, right. you can see on his head there he's got the York and Lancaster regiment cap badge that obviously shows what regiment he is in as we mentioned earlier on my head I have got the Brodie helmet uh, sort of the same pattern as the First World War that continued on to the Second World War. Uh, this is spray sprays the desert colour again, like the khaki colour. Uh, it's also got the khaki helmet net as well. For this headwear, yes, yes I think there's everything for our headwear. Okay, but uh, one other thing with the clothing that I sort of forgot to mention. <laughs> Whilst a lot of this would have been manufactured back in Britain and shipped out to the, the chaps in the desert. Some of it could be locally made, locally sourced, uh, privately purchased. So the uh, India made a lot of the khaki kit for us as well. So Ruben could be wearing an Indian made jumper. His trousers could also be a local, local made. They'd be handmade by people in the villages, perhaps that we came across all the big towns and produced en masse uh, for the soldiers. There's many different things. If you had a bit more money, you could purchase as well. Like I said, the shoes. What else could you privately purchase, Ruben? All sorts, I suppose. Oh, well. <laughs> Jumpers, yes, for example, yes, that sort that, of thing, yeah. uh, as well. So yeah. lots of officers as well uh, could be seen in pictures be wearing sandals. That's another common thing yeah. they wore. Um, I sure will we'll be posting a couple of pictures up as well in this video to have a look at. Yeah. So I think that's uniform-wise everything done. Uh, we should talk quickly about the equipment and the weapons of the chaps in the desert campaign. So you see here Ruben has adopted the fighting kit battle order of the chaps in the, the Western Desert, North Africa and Brook. So you famously hear of the Desert Rats, they were the 8th Army, uh, an armoured division even, and they were fighting also in North Africa with Monty. Uh, but as Ruben said, the York and Lanx were in the 6th Army, the 70th Ar uh, Infantry Division. And it's thought that they didn't wear their star. They had a red, a right. four-pointed red star yeah. on their tunics uh, as the insignia, but it's not thought that they actually wore them on their uniforms. <laughs> so he wears the pretty standard 37 pattern equipment that just keeps spinning around. He's yep. got his Bren gun pouches. Uh, he somehow managed to promote himself to Lance Corporal, our streaky there. <laughs> and he's managed to get hold of a second 37 pattern belt to hold his shorts up. This can be seen on photographs from the desert. Um, pass. So he's got his Bren gun uh, utility pouches here. So this would carry his ammunition, his grenades, um, that sort of thing. Uh, his standard 37 belt holds it all together. Cross straps, spin around. Hello, uh, being attacked by the wind now. There's a sandstorm coming, I think. He has a small pack. This contains all of his spare kit, his wash roll, his cleaning kit. We'll show you a bit about that in a minute. We've got that set up over in India. <laughs> he has an entrenching tool and handle for digging in. I mean, useful in the desert. There's many positions could be dug in. You could fill sandbags if uh, you could find the sand <laughs> to do that. So he carries one of those. He carries a water bottle. Staying hydrated would be very important. So he'd carry one water bottle there. He'd also have a spare water bottle. Leave us about two pints of water in that and carry a spare one in his small pack as well. And then he has over this side, sorry, the bayonet. This is the 1907 pattern 3A3D Enfield bayonet. So it's the same one that they were using in the First World War, but this is quite popular at the early part of the Second World War, particularly in the desert, lots of open space. You can use this to, to good effect. So we'll show that on the rifle in a minute. As he said before, his Mark II Brody helmet there with the canvas chin strap that's been sprayed up for the desert. Yes. So I think that's all for weapons. This is his battle order. This is what he'd be doing most of his fighting in. 
So, one other piece of Oops. kit he would have that we forgot about, which is in a bit of a sorry state at the moment, would be his anti-gas equipment. So, gas was very much feared. Probably like that. <laughs> like so. so, he would carry that. If we just move this to the string, he would, cause it should go around him. So it would be tied to his chest. And this has his gas mask in it, his service respirator. Could get it out. So get it out and have a look. This is the earlier Second World War pattern with the canvas face mask. The same issued to all army troops. And it's a box respirator, so it has uh, a tin with the filter in. I believe. Did we get the tin out? No, no. So he carries that on his front for ease of access. Uh, the deserts can be compared, I suppose, to the First World War in that it was big open spaces uh, much of the time. So gas, if it was going to be used, would be greatly effective in a desert-like situation. Um, yep. Effective and against sandstorm, yes. maybe. Maybe I don't know. They were also issued with the goggles that can be seen uh, in the sandstorms. Uh, but to jump in on Ethan's little talk yep. about the gas, also in the front, we would have the the eye shields, the anti-gas eye shields there. They would come, I don't know how many is in here, but they would come with the eye shields in case of emergency and the anti-dim cloth that you'd use to wipe uh, steam from the uh, eye pieces. I think that's everything I've got in here. Okay. Yes. So that is his gas equipment as well. Turn it off you for now. Can you remove the, the helmet now? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and we're going to rifle, yep. String it. So the standard rifle, obviously at the start of the Second World War for the chaps of the desert, uh, Western Desert of Africa, was the 303 assembly Leonfield rifle. Uh, there, everyone gives a nice demonstration. It's a bolt action rifle. Holds 10 rounds in the magazine, it has a nice effective range and again, as we found in the First World War, when you've got big open plains like a desert, you can very easily use that to great effect yes. to mowing down your enemy. Uh, one story about this rifle is when they were at the uh, Royal Fusiliers were using the 303 SMLE at the Battle of Mons, they were using them against German machine gun troops and they were able to fire it so quickly that the Germans thought they were up against uh, a battalion of machine guns. So you could do about 30 rounds a minute with that. Uh, Raymond? I don't think I could do that many. <laughs> the mad, the mad minute. The cycle through rounds. Oh, I can. <laughs> right, so, very good. So that was an effective service rifle. And it wasn't really replaced out in North Africa uh, until the last part of the war when they were using the number four SMLE rifles. So that's equipment. Other weapons they could have been using and certainly came against uh, the Thompson submachine gunner even. Yes, these were supplied uh, at the beginning of the war by the Americans. They can be seen um, to be used by the Home Guardsmen um, in Britain. And uh, I think corporals were mainly issued with these. Um, out in Africa and Italy, uh, there's lots of pictures of those being used. Um, yes, I think. Yeah, it's an effective submachine gun, pretty much. The magazine holds 15 rounds in there. Yes, a slightly longer one, I believe. Or it can yeah. take a drum mag, which has more as well. This is an early mark of the Thompson, the 1928 model. It has a grooved barrel, and the bolt is on the top rather than the side. So. The gangster weapon, <laughs> seeing service in the desert. They might come up against, we've got this just for display here, this is a German K98 rifle and is the standard sort of rifle for the German army out in the desert as well. We're fighting against the German, the Africa Corps, so their uniforms were similar in the khaki material, uh, the Etex material, but they were slightly different colour. The Italians too were using bolt action rifles and khaki kit as well. So to adapt for warfare, to adapt, I mean the British army they'd been uh, fighting in hot climates for hundreds of years, the chaps in the desert at the start of the war particularly were there on empire service, they were policing the empire, uh, they had experience of fighting in conditions such as uh, the warm sun and the dust, uh, but when newer troops got sent out 
as the war progressed, they had to quickly adapt to the weather. So a bit about the pass or the, the, the routine. Uh, over here we've got our soldier, our Lance Corporal, having a wash in the morning. So he's using wash. the wash basin there. He's got a towel. He might also shave every morning as well. To have a shaving stick, but you would have a shaving stick that you would put the foam on. You can carry on. <laughs> yep, so you'd brush that in and shave there with the razors. So this water stand, they could also turn it into a bath with a bigger bit of canvas and soap as well. Staying clean in these conditions was particularly important. You'd put up with not just the Germans as your enemy, uh, but flies as well, flies and other tropical creatures. Yeah. So staying clean, important. You'd be sweating a lot as well, brushing your teeth, <laughs> all sort of hygiene there. So you'd be sweating a lot, so cleaning was important. Showering too. Uh, he may also take salt tablets, which I don't think we've got any of, but when you're sweating a lot you'll be losing salt and you will need to replace that, so salt tablets are something issued to the troops to try and keep up their, their vital, what's the word? Vitamins, not vitamins, um, vitamins and minerals and things, yeah. So lots of research was done into the best way to protect our troops. Um, it always been the case really whilst having men out in the empire so the more personal kit yes so other bits demonstrate some personal kit oh. here i believe so as ruben said or as ruben demonstrated there you have your shaving kit perhaps a mirror to you want to shave correctly and you can also use the mirror for signaling and such of things in a sunny desert to have a housewife which is basically a sewing kit all your repairs would have to be done in the field. If you're in a, particularly in the middle of nowhere, if you're in a local town, you could perhaps pay someone in the locality to do your, your needlework. But uh, for much of the troops, it would be doing it themselves. Maintaining your rifles is a highly important thing. So you can have a pull through. This would go down the top of your barrel. You'd then be able to open the bolt. Mine doesn't come out, it's a deactivated rifle, so it won't happen, but they would come out the bottom and you'd be able to pull through the barrel. That's why it's called a pull through. You could also use oiled bits of cloth to ensure all of the bolt stayed working in these dusty and sandy conditions. You needed to make sure your weapons were clean. This is a mess tin, so you'd have two of these. And you basically do everything in this. This is if you didn't have a bowl like this, you could shave in it, you could wash in it, you would have to cook in it and eat out of it. So this would be a nice multi purpose bit of kit. You might have comforts from home. These are just some Horlix tablets, but you might have sweets or something like that. And that's out of date. Yeah. <laughs> Foot powder also greatly important as we'd learned in the First World War, keeping your feet clean. Uh, although in the desert you might not find the wet conditions as much as you would elsewhere, foot powder would also help. But mainly in places like in Burma, yeah. when you're fighting in jungle conditions, there would have been lots of swamps, so you would be expected to apply foot powder, I think twice a day, perhaps, um, to ensure that your feet were well looked after. You didn't lose any toes. <laughs> <laughs> we also have here tea pot uh, tea carrier even so cups of tea vitally important keeping you hydrated tin mug there knife and fork knives weren't an issued piece of kit but if you could get hold of a knife it would come in very very handy and the fork as well for eating with and of course these are might be as we're talking about a private purchase item a pair of sunglasses here uh, could manage to get hold of and then wear whilst you're off on on leave or something. <laughs> and as we said before, shell dressing, everyone would carry one of these inside the shell dressing packet. You would have a bandage there. So this would be used, you could apply it to yourself or apply it to a friend if they were wounded. 
uh, to try and help save their life until you could get to a field or something like and that. And as you could see, today. all this would be kept in your wash roll yep. inside your small pack, which is what I had on my back earlier when we demonstrated the webbing. Yeah, so I think that's most of what they carried in the desert. This stuff would carry over into India and Burma. So we will talk a bit more about what would happen in India. There wasn't necessarily too much fighting, but you'd be on leave quite a bit and troops would be stationed in different parts throughout the war. So we'll talk to you a little bit about that and about the story of one chap in the Norfolk Regiment who saw service out in the Far East. Raven, we're we doing India now. Oh, hang on. I just, I'm just, I'm just busy at the moment. <laughs> oh, you're flying Something you didn't mention was toilet roll. Toilet so roll, a, a vital part of the chaps, chaps kit. Actually, I've got any more. No, sorry. <laughs> so latrines could be dug behind your positions, and uh, yes, you'd get to use your issued toilet roll, which was a bit like tracing paper. Uh, but yep, yeah, we will see you in India. Hello, and you are now in. India. So we have arrived here in Bombay. Um, but before I go into a bit more and um, talk about Bombay, first I'll just tell you a bit about who we are and who we're training. Um, to a man I have been researching, um, he was in the 2nd Infantry Division and uh, the 4th Infantry Brigade of the Royal Norfolk Regiment on uh, the 2nd Battalion. And what he did, he was in the BEF in Dunkirk and he trained in Yorkshire and Scotland and then in 1942 his unit was sent over to India and in 1944 they joined the 14th army in Koma and they fought out in Koma and Burma against the Japanese. But today now we are going to be talking about the 2nd Infantry Division uh, and a little bit about the different units um, in Bombay, in India, I think, yeah. Yeah, so the insignia of the uh, Second Infantry Division. Yes, was a pair of cross keys, uh, which you can see there. So this is my slouch hat, uh, similar to the Australian style hat, but the British were um, issued these as well in the First and Second World War. Uh, gives you protection from the sun, very stylish, and you can yeah. also wear the button down Sort of more of a sun hat if you're fighting. So these are seen quite quite popular in Burma towards the end of the war, but they were also worn uh, when troops were stationed and on leave in India. So as we say, particularly Bombay. So the uniform has changed slightly from the fighting kit uh, in the deserts to a more sort of smarter, uh, relaxed look. So the headgear I'm wearing, Ruben. Is yes, Ethan is wearing a pith helmet here again with the cross keys there gives you lots of protection from the sun um, but these are very lightweight as well yep. so they don't hurt your head so these are the Wolseley pith helmets that were introduced sort of during the first world war so these are the last sort of the last um, remaining bit of kit from the empire made of light cork with wide brims to protect the neck and face so these we're really coming towards the end of their lives, being replaced by slouch hats and things like yeah. that. But they're still sort of seen uh, throughout the war as well. There's the other headgear um, that was popular were the FS caps. There I've got the Norfolk Regiment cap badge on, um, as that's the, what we have trained. Yep, and as the war progressed, the general service beret as well could also be seen out in the Far East, uh, out in India. So however, also... sorry, sorry. No, um, okay. however, when they went over to India and Burma, as these are still woolen, and as the uniforms changed for jungle greens, they issued a new jungle green um, GS cap, which I unfortunately I haven't got, but they're also very lightweight and could be worn. And well. the same, the same with the FS caps as well. There's evidence to show that some of these were perhaps made out of the same Airtex khaki drill material. Uh, we haven't got hold of one of them either, but they could be made into the, the FS caps as well. Yes. So Reuben is now wearing a jacket, is it a bush jacket? Yes, yeah, a, a bush jacket, bush, jacket. bush tunic. Um, you can see this is the British style here. Again, I've got the cross keys, 2nd Infantry Division uh, insignia. I've also got my Royal Norfolk um, epaulette shoulder, uh, shoulder slides. Uh, very nice there with the, with the lovely belt. You've got four pockets 
and the full open buttons. This so, was commonly yeah. used by the British. Yeah, so he might look like an officer in the same way that officers had their own bush jackets and sort of thing, but he isn't. He is yes, just a normal, private, a normal yeah. soldier there. Um, but these uh, were favoured things by the sorry by the soldiers to buy and purchase if they could if they weren't issued. Um, so the one I'm wearing here is an Indian made one. So the material Ruben, come up. Yeah, the material is still the same air text material. It's just a bit light, uh, a bit heavier, a bit more yeah. denser. So if you look at comparison to Ruben's original tunic here and the original Indian tunic, not sure how well the lighting is, but the colour is slightly different and the thickness and feel of the material is also. Uh, slightly different sizes, yeah. some of the stitching, yeah. and of course the belt. And the style of the but uh, the pockets, Ethan's lower two pockets have not got a button on the top there, yeah. whereas mine have. And the belt differences as well, rather than the brass buckle on there, it's just two buttons. But again, these were privately purchased in India. Um, on our lower halves, I've still got the shorts. Can you help me up? <laughs> the shorts there. And I've got my long socks there. Um, as we are only in <laughs> India um, and we're not actually fighting yet, we're still walking around. So I have got um, my Oxford uh, shoes back from the home front, or back from when I was back in Britain. Um, Ethan, he has still got the trousers <laughs> on. They still were issued trousers. Yeah. It's just whatever you prefer, trousers or shorts, um, each man to their own. Yeah, and it could be proven that they could be issued on a unit, regimental or battalion basis, so every red, like uh, every unit would have the same kit layout. But we've got a few photographs, and they're wearing various kit within the same sort of group of friends in the same uh, same company. So yeah, it's really varied. Sure. So we've also got, of course, Ruben has the, the British-made original shorts on there. But we've also got a pair of Indian-made shorts. So perhaps that were made by companies in Bombay that were trying to make a bit of yes, extra again, money. Again, privately purchased. They were copied off the British style of shorts, but they didn't have the shell dressing pocket. Maybe they thought you didn't need a shell dressing if you weren't necessarily fighting. Um, the material but, again, yes, again is just different. slightly different. The button layouts too, and the clothing uh, as well. So that's an Indian pair of khaki. That's the uniform. Uh, so we're going to show you some of the bits we've got from the second model from Bombay, uh, some of the things you might be doing whilst sta stationed there and not actually uh, fighting. Ruben will go through some of that yeah. to show you. Thank you. So uh, you weren't fighting um, all the time in India, uh, mainly you were just stationed in Bombay um, until you were then moved on to fight in Burma and, in and Kerma. Uh, but over here on the uh, desk area we have got a couple of items that soldiers would have been doing. Start over this side, good nice original diary there. Uh, diary writing was still very important to keep people's morale up. You've still got the original writing in there, uh, what the soldier was up to when he was out in Bombay. Another similar thing to the writing is you've got the letters, lots of letters were being written home and received. Um, again, that's very good for morale. You can see here the nice uh, stamps, they're the Indian special. Um, George Stamps. Yep. So we've got some pictures there of the chap that we has researched, a man called John Tremlin. And you can see here, this is the picture um, of him when he was in the BEF in Dunkirk. Um, and then we've got some other little pictures here. Uh, shows a variety of the kit that was being worn. Um, this is him on the right here. You've got the bush jacket I'm wearing with the cross keys insignia. Uh, with the lovely trousers and the Oxford shoes. Here you've got some more chaps. John's wearing the shorts, the bush jacket, the sleeves rolled up. Um, you've got another man here, looks possibly to be either Indian in the trousers or jungle greens as they're lighter. And this man um, uh, possibly wearing his own civilian clothing. And again, the shorts and the shirt. You've got this picture here showing the um, pith helmets being carried there. Everyone's wearing trousers and their bush jackets in India and another one with shorts and shirts there in India. But yes, photography was another important thing. Everybody was out yes. and lots of different activities took place, which I think Ethan will just talk to you briefly okay. about. So we've got some original bits of paperwork here, as you said, from Bombay. 
So these little books, welcome to Bombay, these could have been handbooks given to the soldiers uh, when they got into the city. So they've got the messages there. It's got the list of churches, the list of swimming baths, the list of cinemas, and in the middle a nice handy map telling you where everything is. So I'll open it a bit there so you get to see where everything in the city is. So these would have just been handbooks they would have been given to help them find their way around. It could very much have been a bit like a holiday whilst you were stationed in Bur Bombay waiting to go over to Burma. So uh, that's that. Places of interest in these lists as well. Another leaflet there, pamphlet. It's got a map of the, the city and all of the things you can do. The food places as well. There we go, we've got some books there, but this is an interesting piece. It's a menu from a Chinese, English, American and Burmanese, uh, Burmese restaurant um, that was in, the, in New Delhi. So if you went to Bombay, you could have gone to New Delhi. It's got the, rest, uh, the menu as well. Shark fins, soups, birds, chickens, fish, and all manner of food you could purchase. Fried prawns, two rupees. Mm. That's not bad, that's not bad. And we'll see. <laughs> so, some special dishes. So it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> a nice piece there. And a business card of a chap in Bombay as well. The uh, Indians were very good with supplying kit, as we said. The I privately he's a purchased tailor, kit. This chap's a tailor, he can make you a lady's dressing gown, uh, silk pyjamas, underwear sets and get yourself we something all, nice for your girlfriend yeah. even. We can also see the khaki shirts, shorts, <laughs> socks and stockings, helmet hats and they're the main things that the army would have probably probably purchased. So these are your reproduction uniform companies of today making kit to sell to the soldiers out there. So that's some of that. Once you'd actually got taken out to Burma, you wouldn't have been fighting with uh, Germans so much anymore, you've been fighting the Japanese. So you've got a sort of aged Japanese flag there. This might be taken home as a memento or something like that. We've also got these, which are a few more leaflets, similar to the ones the Germans were dropping in Dunkirk. We believe these to be uh, dropped by the Japanese as trying to encourage us to surrender. So that's some of the items that were in uh, in Bombay and the kit that the chaps were wearing. So thank you very much. That was our um, talk on North Africa and then India and the khaki drill uniforms and equipment yep, associated so with those. Showing some of the things we've got in the collection really, uh, to that side of uh, the war, sort of forgotten side of the war perhaps out in the Far East. Obviously we'll be celebrating VE Day on the 8th of May. But for the chaps out in Burma and India, the war didn't finish until August uh, with VJ Day. Um, so that's been us in our lovely warm desert today. Yes, we yes. hope that uh, every week we'll produce a video like this to showcase some of our kit and hopefully educate as well. So next week, where are we going to be next week? Next week, I think we'll be doing Arnhem and we will we'll be doing um, perhaps an airborne uh, display decision to Ireland where we used to be. Um, last week, if you didn't see it, me and Ethan were in the ARP, the Civil Defence, and we had a post set up in the shed. Uh, please do check out that video if you haven't already. Um, like I say, next week we'll be doing Airborne, and hopefully the week after that, who knows what we'll do. If you have any requests, maybe we might do them. Yeah, <laughs> We've got lots of uniforms to get through. Is so, anything yeah. you'd like to particularly see us try to do, any questions you'd like answered, just put them in the comments. Uh, but we hope you've enjoyed this video. It's been a sort of put together and uh, We're still learning all the time. Yes. So it's been It's been a pleasure Pretty to good. record, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, I've been Ruben. Been and I'm Ethan <laughs> Together we are <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, thank you very much.